Um, I want to get started this morning uh, with a little bit of participation. Uh, so there are three key events um, or, or sets of events uh, in, in the Bible, in the scriptures. And, and it's not as though um, other events aren't important, um, but, but really these three events are like the major plot points in the Bible story. And these are the events that, the events that, that if you miss them um, or don't understand them, you, you just will not understand the story that the Bible is telling, right? It would be like going to the bathroom during one of the most important scenes in a movie. And you come back and you go, wait, what's happening? Or you might even recognize this in your own life. You could probably name two, maybe even four, like defining events, defining moments in your life. That, that if, if people don't know about these events, they don't understand these events. They just might not ever get you as a person, right? So I want you to write down for me your list of these three central events in the Bible. But I'll get it started for you. Um, number one for Christian readers of the Bible has to be the final week of Jesus' life. A Christian tradition has referred to this week as Holy Week. Um, it includes Jesus' royal entry into Jerusalem, the Last Supper, the crucifixion, his death, burial, and then finally the resurrection. All four Gospels emphasize these events. And then in the writings that follow the Gospels, Paul and other writers refer to them and build on them in nearly every breath. So that's the first one. So, real quickly, would you write down the second two? The second and the third. Yes. Nope, no chronological order. Just what are the three? Yes. Yep, the whole, oh, the whole of Scripture. What would be the three events? So I gave you number one. What would be two and what would be three? <laughs> sure. Sure. That's, okay, so, so that's not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> should, I was helping you out there. I, w I was helping you out there. She, oh, she said, uh, could one of the events uh, be yet to happen? He said, sure, I'll kind of like wishy washy. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. What happens if you fail? You just get to realize you might have some more Bible reading to do. Um, so, what did you write as number two? Creation, Creation. Exodus, Abraham. Exodus. Okay. Okay. Getting kicked out of the. Cool. Okay. So I heard. I heard a few different things. Um, so I'm going to offer you what, what I believe are the, the next two, um, and we can have all kinds of fun discussions about this afterwards. Um, number two, I, I'm convinced, is the exodus. The exodus. <laughs> Moses, Moses tells Pharaoh to let my people go. You get the 10 plagues, the last one being the death of the firstborn, the parting of the Red Sea, the wilderness journey to Mount Sinai, over and over and over throughout the First Testament. What do we hear God reminding his people when he's calling them to follow him and walk with him? For I am your God who brought you out of Egypt. Like this is a defining characteristic of who their God is. Not only is this then the, the most important set of events in the First Testament. But these events are the essential background to Holy Week. So that when Jesus gathers at the table for communion, he is taking the Exodus story and saying, you know this story, God is acting again. 
Okay, so if the death and the resurrection of Jesus are number one and the exodus is number two, I, I heard a number of options. What is the third? <laughs> I'm going to suggest that it's not creation. <laughs> and we, and we could totally discuss this. Here, here's why. In the overwhelming sort of threat, like all of the content of the First Testament, um, the focus on God as creator is there. It's important. It's, it's an important reality, um, but it's, it's not, at least according to the First Testament, a defining event. And so here's, here's what I am convinced that it is. The exile. The exile. And, and, if, and if you go, if you either thought, what's the exile? Or you go, I don't, I don't see it. It means that there are whole chunks of the First Testament that you could devote yourself to reading and rereading over the next few years. The books of Kings and Chronicles, all of the prophets, uh, the stories are driving to the exile. Um, so Babylon, the nation, the empire of Babylon, sieging and destroying Jerusalem, along with the southern kingdom of Judah. The king in the line of David, removed from the throne, the temple in Jerusalem destroyed, and the tens of thousands of people taken to live in Babylon. This is the exile. And this is one of the two hubs of the First Testament. As you read the story, everything is either pointing back to Exodus or forward to exile. So that in the same way that the First Testament just overflows with these reminders about God's powerful hand to save his people from Egypt, there is nearly uh, equal opportunity uh, for warnings about coming pain and destruction and tragedy if God's people uh, refuse to trust the God who set them free from slavery in Egypt. If you think in addition to the warnings, if you turn to the end of the book of Kings, it tells this story in, in rich detail. And then turn to the end of the book of Chronicles and you get basically a repeat of the story. Earlier this year, we were in the book of the 12, what we call, uh, sometimes call the minor prophets. And all of the minor prophets are announcing this coming exile and then begin to deal with the aftermath of it. And then we get to Jeremiah. <laughs> and it, it, you could say that it is the central event in the book of Jeremiah so that Jeremiah actually tells us about the exile twice in addition to announcing it's coming uh, any number of times. So the last chapter of Jeremiah will be a, a historical detailing of how the exile comes to be. But here in our chapter, this, in our passage this morning, um, we get to the end before the end, uh, and we actually get the first of the two tellings. And so the question becomes, well, and it's an important question because as we read the First Testament, one of the ways that we constantly experience it is, man, this book's super negative and dark and like destruction-y. Um, and it all revolves around this event called the exile. And as followers of Jesus, people who read the same scriptures that Jesus did, these First Testament scriptures, we find this story being told over and over again. Think of the people in your life who are storytellers. Think of the stories they tell you over and over again. Why do people tell the same stories over and over again? Because they're the stories that define their lives. They're the stories that that means something about who they are. It's where they find significance. It's where they, they find their identity. 
And so God seems to think it's important that his people hear this story of the exile again and again in order to shape us as a certain kind of people. And, and as, we, as we work our way through Israel's scriptures, we find that they're filled with stories and songs and prayers that, that are designed to help God's people remember these horrific events. And we just heard bits of how horrific they are this morning. But, but we have to acknowledge it. it's just not, it's not enough to just remember. Like these stories and songs and prayers help God's people learn from and begin to make something of the greatest tragedy in their history. And as followers of Jesus, our history. And so in this story of the exile, the church has confessed for 2,000 years, we have been given a gift, a, a, a weird and bizarre gift for sure, but, but a gift nonetheless, because God has taken one of the very worst tragedies that a group of human people have endured, and he has told and retold this story so that, so that his people might learn from them and so that we might turn to God in the midst of our own tragedies. God has given us these stories so that we might know him, so that we might know who he is, so that we might learn to see him in the world around us, so that we might trust him even as the world is falling apart around us. Now, the events that we read about this morning um, are probably uh, pretty different from some of the tragedies you are experiencing in your own life or the tragedies that people around you are, are suffering. The exile is fundamentally a tragedy of Judah's own making. But in these accounts, we discover that, that in the face of tragedy, whether it's tragedy you caused uh, or not, we have the ability to make things worse for ourselves. Who's excited about that? <laughs> I mean, basically I just said that when we, in that moment where we think that things are the worst that they have ever been, we have the ability to make them even worse. And so, whether you are living through self-made tragedy, right, having destroyed your own life or the lives of people around you, or, or whether you are living through tragedy that is, that is completely out of your control, our passage offers us guidance through tragedy. For those of you who today feel like life is going pretty well, uh, those of you who, who don't really have anything super serious going on, uh, I'll offer you a challenge. The way that you live with God today will prepare you for tragedy in the future. In fact, our, our passage this morning introduces three, what I think are three specific practices that are essential for walking through tragedy well together. When tragedy comes, um, if you can do well these three things, um, I think that you will be in a, a good place to stick near with God. And, and so the three things are testimony, the ability to give testimony in the midst of tragedy, uh, the ability to practice discernment, and the ability to accept a new normal. Testimony, discernment, acceptance. So, so testimony is the practice of seeing and naming where God is at work. Testimony is the practice of seeing and naming where God is at work. Discernment is the practice of seeing and describing how God sees and describes. 
and acceptance is the practice of receiving life as it is. As, as an opportunity to walk with God and to trust him deeply. I, I want you to think about these practices uh, like you, as a skill, like you might uh, think about hitting a baseball or knitting or dribbling a basketball or playing an instrument or cooking or singing or, or fixing a car and on and on and any other number of skills. Like it's possible probably for any one of us to do any one of those things, those, those skills, to figure them out at least once without having much experience. But that's not the same as doing those things well, right? To become skilled in any one of them requires practice. In fact, to be able to use any of them in your life sort of on command, they need to become a habit, a second nature. And so consider if you can develop the habit of testifying to the work of God before disaster strikes, you will be ready to see where God is at work when tragedy surprises you. If you can make wise discernment, second nature, you will already be asking the right sorts of questions the moment you're facing new and unfamiliar circumstances. And, and if you've learned to be content in all circumstances, you will have cultivated the skill of accepting what is to receive life as it comes, rather than fighting to recover a life you've lost, is necessary to rebuilding life in the midst of tragedy. Walking through tragedy without these skills is a bit like being thrown into a new job without any training. Maybe you know what that experience is like. It's not impossible but man, it's hard and you better be a fast learner. And so I'd like for you to be thinking this morning about which of these practices God may want or need to develop in you. Is it testimony or discernment or acceptance or all three? And so we'll start by walking through our passage a bit and seeing where God is, is teaching us um, these practices. Uh, so when chapter 39 starts, We jump right into the devastating and tragic story of Judah's end. Think about, think about the life that the people in this land are now facing. We heard this read earlier. After a year and a half siege of the city, where people were starving so badly that they were beginning to eat other human beings. The king, at first sign that the enemy has broken through the city, runs, flees, abandons his people in the city. But then he's caught, and the king watches as his sons and leaders are all killed. The king then has his eyes blinded. The Babylonians then burn down the palace, they burn down the city, they destroy the walls, and then they carry off the remaining people to Babylon. And you might think, right, this is bad enough. This is as bad as it gets. But most of us don't know the horror and the fear and the uncertainty of armed transitions of power. No sooner have the Babylonians taken off uh, the, the remaining people and set up a puppet governor, but a guy named Ishmael decides to assassinate the governor and all of his supporters. He also brutally murders a group of people who have come to worship God. 
And then almost as quickly, another local militia comes and they cause Ishmael to flee. I mean, can you talk about a nightmare scenario? Like it's bad enough when Babylon comes in and destroys everything. There, there was at least the promise of rebuilding. There was some sense of structure and of order. But now the people remaining are fighting between themselves and there's this legitimate fear that now Babylon is gonna have to come back. Babylon has already come back and they've seen what Babylon can do. Things are only looking worse. To which you might ask, like, what is even worse even look like. So this is the context of testimony. Like who's, who's feeling ready to just jump up and start singing God's praise in the midst of this hellscape? I mean, honestly, like how in the world do you offer any sort of testimony in the midst of this? And maybe you know this feeling of being like, how could I offer God a word of praise in the midst of what I am going through, what I am experiencing? Well, the people in the story don't really offer us much help. It's actually the storyteller, the narrator of our passage this morning who models for us how to see and talk about what God is doing because in chapter 39, starting in verse 10, we read, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah some of the poor people who owned nothing and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. This little verse is a ray of sunshine in the midst of darkness. See, Jeremiah has told us before that, that under Judah's kings, the poor have been repeatedly oppressed. With all of God's prophets, we've learned that this, the oppression of the poor, of widows and orphans, this is one of the reasons why God is judging his people and taking them into exile. And so going back all of the way to some of God's earliest instructions, God made it clear that, that his people, if you were to be his people, if you were to identify with the God who brought you out of slavery in Egypt, you were to be a people who, who set others free. And so you were to care for the poor. This meant meeting their immediate needs, sometimes it was just the need in the moment, but also then enabling them to regain their family land and their opportunity to start over. God has consistently criticized his people through the prophets, specifically the rich and the powerful for refusing to willingly and, re and freely redistribute their own wealth that they gained on the backs of the poor. But as the prophets have been saying to the people, woe, they've also been announcing that the day of the Lord is coming. A day when the mighty rich are brought down and when the lowly poor are lifted up. Our passage is telling us that that day has arrived. The rich and the powerful of the land of Judah have had everything stripped from them as they are as they've been taken off and forced to live in Babylon. And meanwhile, the weak and the poor have been given what they need to build a new, a new life in God's land. They have been given the very thing that God promised to give his people, land to cultivate and to honor God with. What God's people refused to do on their own, God has now used pagan, foreign Babylon to help them do. Through Babylon, God has successfully Robin Hooded the rich. I don't know if that's a verb, but I'm using it as one today. To Robin Hood someone. But think about how cool that is. 
I mean, it's not cool if you're like the rich and the powerful in Judah. That kind of sucks. But um, think about how cool it is. God's will has been done. And in God's will being done, there is a sign of the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. That's just one of the testimonies that we find in this passage. And there's more testimony to give. Uh, God made a promise to Jeremiah in chapter one, the very beginning of this book, God promised to be with Jeremiah. And he said that his promise to be with Jeremiah meant that he was going to deliver Jeremiah from anyone who would fight against him and try to take his life. And so in verse 11, we then read uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I mean, gee, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave command concerning Jeremiah. He knows this prophet by name. Through Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, saying, take him, Jeremiah. Look after him well and do no harm but deal with him as he tells you. Um, he treats Jeremiah better than all of Jeremiah's own people do. That's awkward. But again and again, Jeremiah survives. He survi uh, survived Judah's kings. Sorry, I got excited there. Um, survived the destruction of, of Jerusalem. Jeremiah even survives as local militias are busy fighting each other back and forth. And weirdly, I just kind of picture him sitting there as nobody had gunfire back then, but I just picture them shooting over his head and he's just like, they're like, our God, I don't know what to do here. We see in Jeremiah's life, God's ability to fulfill his promise to deliver him from death. We see God with Jeremiah. And unfortunately, we have not been promised any sort of escape from death the way that Jeremiah was promised. But you know what promise we do share with Jeremiah? The promise that God will be with us until the end of the age so that we can do what God has called us to do, knowing that he is with us the way he was with Jeremiah. and maybe most powerfully, because Jesus has gone to the grave in anticipation of us. We can trust that God is with us even in death. In the midst of tragedy, we can then confess and testify to the truth that God has not abandoned his people this is incredible news. And the narrator of our passage testifies to God's ongoing presence with Jeremiah. And, and quickly, there are two more testimonies that, that are, are worthy events that, are, that our narrator sneaks into this tragic story of destruction. And both of them have to do with Gentiles, outsiders, foreigners, pagans. God is redefining the boundaries of who might be counted among his people. First, we see a Gentile blessed by God because of his faith. And so in, in, verse, in chapter 39, verse 18, Jeremiah says to an Ethiopian man, these are the Lord's words, for I will surely save you and you shall not fall by the sword, but you shall have your life as a prize of war because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. Jeremiah uh, told the story of this Ethiopian back in chapter 38. While God's own people were attacking Jeremiah and trying to silence him, this Ethiopian comes to Jeremiah's aid. And for this, God has rewarded him. The, this Ethiopian is rewarded as one of God's own while God's own people are being disciplined. And then finally, the last testimony comes from the captain of the guard, Nebuzaradan. He has clearly listened to Jeremiah, or at least someone has told him what Jeremiah has said because he recites the Lord's words that Jeremiah has spoken. He recites them back to Jeremiah. I love this because in the midst of tragedy, 
the only person, uh, not counting Jeremiah, but the only person who offers a verbal testimony of what God is doing is a foreigner who, who has listened to and trusted God's word. And so the, this is the question for us around testimony. Like, do you know what God is doing in the world? Like, do, you, do you know what God has done? Will you give testimony to his work in the Exodus and in the exile? Will you give testimony to the last week of Jesus' life? Can you, see what God, can you see God's will being done around you? Even if it's not being done in ways that you expected, can you recognize God's word being faithfully preached? Maybe especially when it's coming from people you don't know or recognize or already trust. When life is falling apart, can you see and name the work of God? Testimony is a learned skill that's learned as we walk with the God who we give testimony to and of. And so may we learn this together. Um, quickly, I want to move on to the second practice that our, our passage introduces to us. Discernment. The practice of seeing how God sees. So in chapter 40, Nebuzaradan comes to Jeremiah. Uh, and he announces Jeremiah's freedom. And this is what Nebuzaradan says, starting in verse four. He says, now behold, I release you today from the chains on your hands. So he's announcing Jeremiah's freedom. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come and I will look after you well. But if it seems wrong to you to come with me to Babylon, do not come. See, the whole land is before you. Go wherever you think it good and right to go. If you remain, then return to Gedaliah, whom the king of Babylon appointed governor of the cities of Judah, and dwell with him among the people. Or go wherever you think it right to go. Jeremiah's given a decision. Go to Babylon, the place where he's already announced the good figs are, the place of hope, or remain in Judah, the place where the bad figs are. In Babylon, he already has the honor and the support and favor of like the king of the whole world, Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful man in the world. In Judah, Jeremiah is at best a polarizing figure and at worst, still believed to be a traitor against his people. But, but the choice that Jeremiah has is so beautifully framed and in a way that's so different from the ways that we tend to frame our choices. Especially when we find ourselves in crisis or in tragedy mode, we tend to frame our choices in pretty poor ways. So we tend to make emotional or impulsive decisions when we're in crisis or tragedy mode. We tend to ask ourselves what we want or what will ease the pain when we're in crisis or tragedy mode. We tend to be short-sighted. We tend to make our very worst decisions when we're in the midst of crisis or tragedy. But Jeremiah's decision in the midst of tragedy is framed the way that all spirit-led discernment is. Is this good? because our God is the one who makes things and calls it good. Is this right? 
Is it righteous? Is it rooted in relationship with God and my neighbors? Is it good? Does it come from God? Does it bear his creative beauty? Is it right? Does it restore relationship? These are the questions God's people ask when they make choices. These are the questions we ought to ask when we make choices. Is it good? Is it right? Moses told the people at Sinai that they needed to discern between life and death. What brings life? What brings death? And this question takes on different forms as we watch uh, the Israelites sort of applying it in different places, but it's ultimately a discernment between like what builds up and what tears down, what draws together and what fractures relationships, what is good and what is evil, what is right or righteous and what is divisive or unrighteous. And I just, I want to leave you quickly with Jeremiah's decision. He knows God's will. Jeremiah knows God's will. Not necessarily God's personal will for his life. We don't get any sense of that. Jeremiah knows the, the will of God. In the very same way that we're told we can know the will of God. And so knowing God's will, Jeremiah chooses what appears to be the harder way forward, a way that resonates with God's will, not his own will. Jeremiah describes that to stay in Jerusalem among the bad figs, uh, he decides that to stay in Jerusalem among the bad figs, figs this was good and right. And so in, in essence, he refuses to escape the tragedy. He decides to live in the place where he will visibly see day in and day out the tragedy that has fallen on God's people. He refuses to settle for the comforts of Babylon. He refuses to let his ego be inflated by the Babylonian king who seems to have favor for him. He refuses to do what he wants. Jeremiah knows resolutely what is good and right, and he chooses it because Jeremiah spent his entire life learning from God how to discern between what is good and right and what is not. And he spent his entire life choosing, learning to choose, to do the good and right small things in close relationship with his father. And so he was ready for this day of tragedy. Once again, uh, the, the question for us is, is fairly simple. Do you know what God's will is? Are you able to see as God sees? Can you discern what is good and right? So that when life is falling apart, can you see what God sees and can you act accordingly? Discernment is a learned skill learned in relationship with God. We learn together. Finally, uh, we move into the final practice, the last practice introduced to us by our passage, acceptance um, or receiving life as it comes. Now, this practice is introduced to us by two figures. And the first we have is Gedaliah. And so if you turn to chapter 40 and you look at verse 9, we find Gedaliah the governor saying to the people, do not be afraid to serve the Babylonians. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon and it shall be well with you. So we have Gedaliah, but then we also have a guy named Ishmael who we're told is of the royal family. Uh, this detail is the key about Ishmael because Gedaliah is not a descendant of King David. And so in a real sense, we immediately understand what Ishmael is doing. Ishmael is doing what people do when their kingdoms have been threatened. To Ishmael, Gedaliah is a fraud. 
He is an illegitimate ruler. And so what does he do? He assassinates him. Ishmael is fighting for a past that doesn't exist apart from the future. Uh, think about that. Ishmael is fighting for a past that doesn't exist apart from the future. God has promised to restore the kingdom to David's family, but that kingdom has to be taken away from David's family first because David's family have not been faithful stewards of it. But there is a future for David's family, but that future is not yet. But Ishmael can't wait. It's worth suggesting that the people of God have done incredible harm in the world by sometimes not waiting. For God to build his kingdom, we have imagined it was our job. That future is not yet. And if God's people are going to be the kind of people who can receive that kingdom in the future, they need to receive the present first. They need to receive Babylon's authority. This takes us back to Tom's sermon a few weeks ago. I, listen to this and listen to how hard this, this word is. They need to receive Babylon's authority as a gift. I saw winces <laughs> among several of you. Because if they can't serve Babylon, they can never be trusted with the kingdom of God. But Ishmael can't be bothered. He can only think about what has been lost. And so he operates principally out of nostalgia for the past. Rather than learn from the past, Ishmael wants to return to it. And so he can't receive the present. He can only fight to reclaim what he feels he has lost. And this is the real irony in this. This is crazy and breaks your brain when you start to think about it. Without Ishmael's help, without the help of someone on the throne of David, God has been busy. God's been busy using pagans and foreigners and illegitimate governors to carry out his kingdom purposes. Praise be to God. The poor are being given new life. Outsiders are being brought into the family of God. The word of God is being proclaimed. All of these things are happening before Ishmael ever gets involved. And all of these things are halted the moment Ishmael jumps into the mix. The guy who thinks he's saving the kingdom of God is working to crush it. He wants to make Judah, the kingdom of his fathers, great again. But God wants to make Judah new, not great. He wants to give them a new heart, a servant's heart. He wants to make them a servant people. He wants to make them small. But Ishmael insists on fighting for the past. When tragedy comes, can you accept life as it comes to you? Uh, can you choose to live within the new normal? Will you seek God? Will you walk with him in the midst of this new normal? 
Or will you spend your life fighting against life as it is? Will you spend your life resisting the invitation to walk with God today, believing that, that no, you have to change your circumstances in order to walk with God again? When life happens, God is inviting us to recognize that he is with us in the midst of that life, whatever it looks like. God is calling us to give testimony to what he's doing. He is calling us to discern what is good and right. And he is calling us to, to accept the world as it comes to us so that he might teach us how to be his people in the midst of it. I, I can't think of any better way to begin practicing testimony and discernment and acceptance than to come to his table this morning. Because we come to the table giving testimony of what God has done in Jesus Christ. We give, we give testimony and we celebrate the good news of what God has accomplished. We learn as we come to this table, new categories for the world right? How to discern under new categories, right? When we come to this table, we discover that death is no longer the worst thing that can happen to us. At this table, we learn that there is now no longer Jew, nor Gentile, male, nor female, slave, nor free. This meal redefines the world for us so that we can discern what is good and right, and we can begin living as the people of God even if the rest of the world doesn't yet operate by these categories, here at this table, Jesus teaches us to. And this table teaches us, as we draw near to Jesus, we seek him, we meditate on who he is to accept both life and death as it comes to us. Jesus could easily have been accused of being the greatest failure to ever live, letting himself be killed right as he was about to build his kingdom. But of course we know that that's silly because it was through his death that he began to build his kingdom. And so he received the death that came to him and that death became a seed that has given birth to new life. And the spirit of God invites us to come and partner with him in his death and in his resurrection so that we might live whatever life the world might give to us or so that we might die whatever death the world might offer to us knowing that whether we live or die, we are in Christ and we have great hope because he is building his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We're gonna to come to his table together and we're gonna give testimony and we're gonna practice discernment and we're gonna to learn to accept as we draw near to the one who invites us. If our servers would come,